Hi everyone. I'm just going to wait for Tina to join us and then we will start. We're just waiting to let Tina in and then we'll begin. Hi everyone. So we're just um, waiting for Dr. Tina Pears to join us and as soon as she does we can kick off. So I'm just going to say hello to a few of you while we're waiting. let the right person in. Is that you, Tina? No, there you are. Hi, Tina. If you can just request to join, I can see you're watching um, and then I can let you in. Sorry guys, we'll just be a few more minutes. Tina, I don't know if you can hear me. If you can just press request to join, um, then I can let you in. Hello, there you are. Hey. <laughs> How are you? You. <laughs> we love technology, don't we? Oh, it, fantastic. It just took a while to request it. Yeah, that's fine. fine. But that's okay. We got there in the end. We did. So um, I wanted, obviously, to... So I'm going to introduce you to everyone first and then we'd love to chat to you about, obviously, your journey. So um, I just wanted to say hi, everyone. Welcome to the Latte Lounge. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce you to our latest guest in our series of Menopause and Breast Cancer Awareness Month speakers, Dr. Tina Pears. So welcome, Tina. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just give everyone a little bit of background about you. So Tina qualified in 1996 as a consultant in contraceptive and reproduction, uh, reproductive health. Um, in 2017, um, you were recognised as a menopause specialist by the British Menopause Society. Um, Tina's been working since 2015 at the Chelsea and Westminster Ho um, Hospital, which is the country's leading NHS menopause clinic, uh, under the mentorship of leading consultant gynaecologist Mr. Nick Panay, and um, you also work in his clinic in Holly Street. Tina is a member of the British Menopause Society and the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Healthcare, and uh, Tina offers advice on contraceptive uh, contraception, menopause management, body identical HRT, PMS treatment options, premature ovarian insufficiency diagnosis and treatment, and you also see women with progesterone sensitivity and histamine intolerance. Um, Tina's passionate that women should receive accurate, up-to-date information about the benefits of HRT, which improves quality of life and long-term health. So welcome, Tina, and um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to obviously talk to you. We've had a lot of these um, uh, Instagram lives this month because it's obviously Breast Cancer Awareness Month and, and also Menopause Awareness Month. And I'm very keen to um, introduce our members to you because not only are you a doctor who specializes in menopause, but you yeah. yourself have been through breast cancer. Yep. So was, <laughs> tell us, take us through your history from when you obviously started. Yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. So, um, 
So as um, Katie, thank you so much for inviting me to do this and for that lovely introduction. Um, I, I, was, um, I was constantly looking after women or the whole of my career, really. And then in 2005, at the age of 45, I found I had a breast lump. And, um, and to be honest with you, I was absolutely terrified because when I was a medical student and when I, I worked as a GP for seven years, uh, when I was a GP all those years ago, you know, decades ago, um, people didn't really do very well with breast cancer. And, uh, and the, the success rate now, the cure rate now is over 90% of early breast cancers that are picked up and we are picking it up nice and early. So, so but in those days, it wasn't when, when I was learning about it and seeing it in patients, it wasn't quite so good. So of course, as soon as I found a lump, I thought that was it really. Um, and um, to cut a long story short, the staff were absolutely marvellous and said, no, you're not going to die. Don't worry. We're going to sort this out for you. And they were so calm and they were so sure and positive that that really helped me. Um, and so I, I was very quickly seen, uh, which I was very grateful for. And I had a lumpectomy. So I had had a grade one um, tumour. It was 1.6 centimetres. So it was the size of a sort of olive, really. And, um, and the bizarre thing is, you know, I think I felt it in the July, but I was so busy, I forgot about it. It's not awful. I think I felt it when it was smaller. And I thought that feels a little strange. And then I just completely forgot about it. I was so knackered all the time with looking after three children and working and everything else. And then it, I found it again in the um, September, October, it was the October uh, 2005. And, um, and I uh, yeah, so it was a grade one. It was 1.6 centimeters. It was, um, it was, I had a lumpectomy very quickly. Uh, and then unfortunately in those days, if you had a micrometastasis in your axilla in the sentinel lymph node, they then did, took all the rest of the nodes or a great many of them, uh, which they don't do now because they were gathering data then to see whether a micrometastasis meant that they got it all uh, or whether anything had gone beyond that first sentinel node. And, um, and I had, my micrometastasis was 0 0.9 millimeters and anything over one millimeter is not a micro. So I was very lucky there, <laughs> but, um, but they did go back three weeks later and did an operation taking out 19 more lymph nodes. And actually that was the worst operation that was really very unpleasant to get, to get well from because I had a few complications. I had um, what they call cording of the lymph nodes and all, the, all my lymphatics in my arm and across my shoulder decided to contract and get shorter. So they weren't long enough for my arm. So I couldn't extend my elbow. I couldn't extend my shoulder. I couldn't, in the end, I couldn't even extend my thumb because it just completely, and that took quite a few months to get better, but it did get better. Um, and I was given a course of um, radiotherapy, as is bog standard, really. Um, the tumour was oestrogen receptor positive and progesterone receptor positive. Uh, so it was very hormonal. And um, I had no family history of breast cancer at all. Um, I have a Mediterranean background, I'm Maltese, and I just thought I'd had my ch my first child at the age of 27. So that was quite good. Um, although that's very young nowadays, isn't it? But um, I was, <laughs> it was, um, yeah, I was considered to be an elderly null nullip, actually. I was called an elderly nullip, which meant that I was thought to be quite old to be having my first baby. Um, and I, um, so I was, I was, yes. Yeah, so what was I saying? So I, I had, and I breastfed all three, I had three children and I breastfed all of them for a year. So I thought I protected myself really and reduced my risk of breast cancer. And I was slim. I didn't drink alcohol. Um, I was fit, you know, and so I really thought I had a minimal chance of getting it. But anyway, I did get it. Um, and I, um, I did very fine on the, on the radiotherapy. Um, and then I was given tamoxifen. And the, the way it was presented to me was very interesting. They said, you have to take this tamoxifen uh, because it's going to reduce your risk of recurrence by 50%. And of course, when you've just been through cancer and you've been cured and you, you just don't want it to come back, you know, you've just been through a bit of a nightmare um, and you think, I, well, I better take it, I better take it. But 50% of what? They didn't say 50% of what? And they didn't say if it would make any difference to my, the death rate, you know, the risk of death. So anyway, so I dutifully took this tamoxifen and I really didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't like it for a number of reasons. I didn't like taking it every day because it reminded me I'd had cancer. 
Whereas actually I felt fit and healthy and I was back to normal. And I just wanted to get on with my life. I didn't want to be taking this pill every day that just reminded me that something could come back and it could be, you know, uh, uh, happen again. So I didn't like that, but I took it. And for the first four, five months, I was absolutely fine on it. I, um, my periods were happening regularly and I just felt fairly normal, not quite as good as normal, but okay. And then suddenly in month five, my period stopped, all my estrogen was switched off. So I had no sex drive, I had no, I couldn't achieve an orgasm, I had no get up and go, I had no joy in life, I felt completely flat, so my face started to change, I started to look like an old lady very quickly, which was really alarming. So I kept looking in the mirror and seeing this old woman looking back and thinking, oh no, you know, I was only, I was only 46 by then, and it was like, what, what's happened overnight, you know? And, um, and I just, I started getting aches and pains in all my joints. I started feeling absolutely exhausted. Um, and worst of all, I started feeling very depressed and suicidal. And I'm such a sort of, you know, cups half full all the time, always look on the positive, always look for the good and everything. And suddenly I was in this bizarre place that I'd never been in before. Um, and I didn't feel like I could pull myself out of it. And it, um, it was really strange. It was almost as if um, my personality had been pushed out of my body into this little, um, a little cage that was sort of in somewhere in my stomach. And this other person was living in my head and was just, just sort of deciding what I was going to say and how I was going to react and what I was going to feel. And it was so alien to me. It was really scary. And I started thinking ridiculous things like, you know, I'm very, really happily married and three lovely children and everything was going well. And um, I started thinking about how I should com commit suicide because they deserve to be happy without me and all this kind of, you know, mm -hmm. stuff, which is quite overwhelming and awful. And it, it suddenly occurred to me that it was because my estrogen was switched off that I was feeling like that. And so I made a unilateral decision to stop taking the tamoxifen. And you know, honestly, Katie, within three days, I started to feel better, uh, which was like a miracle. Um, and the, um, within a few weeks, I started having periods again, and my estrogen was back, and my cycle was back, and I started to feel like myself. And it was such a huge relief, I can't tell you, because but apart from thinking about killing myself, I was also thinking about divorcing my husband <laughs> because I kept thinking he deserves to be with somebody who's happy and I'm not happy, so I should let him go. You know? And I mean, we've been together since, since I was 17, so it was just, we're like, you know, what was I thinking? Anyway, it didn't happen and we're still together and it's all very good. But um, anyway, so... Um, so I then had my annual appointment with a consultant oncologist and with the consultant surgeon. And I said to them, I'm so sorry, I'm not taking this tamoxifen. And the oncologist said to me, OK, so you believe in um, quality of life rather than longevity. And I said, yes, actually, I do, because I can't live the way I was feeling. It was just too awful. You know, you survive a, a, a life, potentially life threatening disease to then live in a living hell. You know, that was just not really an option for me. So um, then when I saw the surgeon, he said, OK, um, so you're you're you've just doubled your risk of getting um, a recurrence. And I said, yes, but what is my risk of getting a recurrence? Nobody's told me the actual numbers. And I really think that that's what women need to ask. We need to ask with any cancers, what are the numbers, not the percentages, because the percentages don't mean anything. You know, if it reduces your risk by 50%, but your risk is one in a million, then who cares? You know, one in a million, one, half in a million. It's not, there's no much, not much difference, you know, but so you need to not know actual numbers. So it, he went on this website um, and we've now got an NHS website called Predict which you can do the same thing. But in those days, it was called adjuvant online. And you put in your statistics, so your age, your state of health, um, how big the tumor was, what kind of grade it was, all this sort of thing, all the details, and whether there were lymph nodes involved and so on. And then it tells you, if there's 100 women like you, what your risks are of death and recurrence. And that's with and without tamoxifen. So you can put in those questions. And it was very interesting. It was really interesting. He said, OK, if we look at um, 100 women exactly like you over a 10 year period, 
the risk of death from this cancer is we'd, we'd expect out of the, sorry, we'd expect out of a hundred women over 10 years, four women to die. And 3.6 of those deaths would be from other causes. Gosh. Right? So 0.4 would be from this particular type of cancer. 0.4 <laughs> per 100 over 10 years. And then he said, right, let's see what it looks like with tamoxifen. It was exactly the same. Whether you took tamoxifen or not, the risk of death was still 0.4 per 100 women. And I said, well, you know, it's death that I'm worried about rather than anything else. Um, so actually, that's fine. It doesn't, the tamoxifen doesn't make a difference. So I'm definitely not taking it. Anyway, then we looked at recurrence risks and they divide that into sort of two groups. There's a high risk of recurrence and a low risk of recurrence. They don't know which one you might be. Um, and so they, he said to me, well, your risk of recurrence without the tamoxifen is either the worst case scenario, 18 out of 100 over 10 years, or the best case scenario, 12. And if you're on tamoxifen, it reduces down to nine and six. So that's where the 50% reduction comes from. And I, being me, said, well, 18% worst case scenario means 82% chance of it not coming back. So that's fine. That's, that's good in my book. That's fine. I'll take it. And it, I said, if it comes back, we'll just deal with it again, you know? I was being really closely monitored. I was having an annual mammogram. I was vigilantly checking myself much more frequently than I did before. And, um, you know, so, so I knew I was being looked after and screened and so on. So I just said, look, if it comes back again, we'll just do that. So he, he was sort of happy. And then he got used to me every year coming back and saying, I'm not on the tamoxifen. And he sort of started to get comfortable with that. Anyway, when I was 48, so three years later, two, two years later, I started getting some of the tamoxifen type symptoms again. And of course, this time it was my menopause coming, my perimenopause. So I still had my periods, but I started getting some pains and tiredness and a bit tearful and um, just poor, terrible sleep, terrible, terrible sleep. And um, a little lack of sleep and exhaustion. And um, I didn't get any hot flushes actually ever, but lots of night sweats, lots and lots of night sweats. So dripping wet duvet, wet having to throw off the cover bring it back on again getting cold as you you know everything evaporates off you so it was very unpleasant and um anyway so then i kept thinking i need hrt how am i going to get somebody to give it to me because i was doling it out like you know dolly mixtures and smarties for to all my lovely ladies who come and see me and um and have been doing you know menopause work since i was a, first qualified as a gp and and i just thought oh this is going to be tragic i'm giving it out to all these women they're all feeling amazing and looking fantastic on it and fully functioning and everything and here i am starting to feel like i was on the tamoxifen again and i was terrified actually because i thought i'm going to start to get depressed and feel suicidal and i can't afford to do that i've got to function at a reasonably high level with three children a husband and a career and all those responsibilities i was running the sexual health services for surrey um and uh, so it was a, i had a lot on my plate and um as do all women but anyway and then i um so it was really strange, actually. I was sitting in a beautiful conference center in Venice, and some of you may have been to it. It's absolutely beautiful. I was sitting there at a women's health conference for the week, and this lovely German professor got up and he said, this lecture is on women post breast cancer being able to take HRT. And I was like, this one's for me. <laughs> and, um, and he said, he, first of all, he started his lecture by saying, these are all the symptoms of the menopause. And there they were, 30 plus symptoms. And I sat there and I ticked them all in my head, except for the hot flushes during the day. Everything else I ticked. And I just thought, come on, you've got to get a grip. You've got to face this now. So at the end of the lecture, I went to speak to him and I said, look, this is my situation. Um, who, who can I speak to who's, you know, you've obviously been investigating it and, and studying it. Who else has been? And he said, well, you need to speak to um, this lovely doctor called Barry Wren, who's in Sydney. And Barry, um, who probably knows your dad, actually, Katie, very well, I suspect. Um, he, um, Barry did a lot of studies um, giving women post-breast -bre post cancer HRT. And so um, I came home and asked my son if he could find Barry Wren's uh, clinic number. 
on the international sort of um, you know directory, and he did. And I left a message on his answer phone. Anyway, he did he did get in touch. It was fantastic, and he sent me all his studies. He was so good. Um, he sent me all his studies. And he, he said to me, he had, we had long conversations by email, um, and he, he said to me, look, you are cured now. You know, you are cured. You're like any other woman who hasn't had breast cancer. So yes, you've got a small recurrence uh, risk, you know, uh, because whatever is in my body that made it the first time could make it another time. Um, uh, and I haven't got anything to change. I haven't got alcohol to give up or weight to lose or anything like that. So I couldn't, you know, I could have changed my diet. Um, and uh, but I didn't because I thought I had a healthy diet anyway. And uh, and he said, look, you you know, you're fine. So if you if it's quality of life and going um, forward to be really healthy in your 50s and your 60s and 70s, then you should you know, you should go on it. So with his blessing, I found somebody privately who would give it to me because, again, very difficult to find somebody in the NHS who would give it to me. We wrote the doctor, the consultant who I saw, and I wrote lots of letters to my GP saying, this is my choice. It was an informed choice and everything. And my GP still refused to give it to me. So I had to pay privately for it um, for quite some time, for some years. Um, anyway, so then I was going happily along. Uh, and at, then in 2014, I was just getting dressed and I could feel another little lump and it was tiny and it was on the side of my chest where I you know, knew I definitely didn't have anything. And I knew immediately that it was another one. I just knew. And so I rang, actually then I rang this incredible plastic surgeon, um, who's a very dear friend of mine and who worked at, works at, he works at the Marsden now privately, but he did work for the Marsden NHS at that time. And he does all the bre breast reconstructive surgery. Uh, his name is Paul Harris and he's, an incredible man. He's such a nice man. And he's so, um, he's just so trustworthy. And he's such a good pair, safe pair of hands, very skilled. And he, um, anyway, I rang him and I said, I'm in trouble. And he said, right, let's get you in. Um, so I got into the Marsden sort of like the next day. And they confirmed, yes, it is. Um, and then they, he said, right, we're going to do this operation. You're going to have to have a mastectomy. And I said, well, that's absolutely fine, but I actually want to have bilateral mastectomies, please, because I don't want to be worrying about the other one. I also wanted to match, you know, yeah. and look the same both sides, but I just couldn't bear the thought of having another breast that could actually, I'd be constantly looking for something else in, you know? And so I said, no, no, I'd like both. He said, oh, well, that's a very understandable emotional response. You know, we'll discuss it sort of, you know, in a few days time, but I was absolutely adamant that it, I needed to have both um, sorted really and so then I had the operation um, within two and a half weeks of finding it I'd had the operation which was amazing mm. and they did um, they did bilateral mastectomies took everything away um, leaving the nipple and all the skin and everything and just gave me some implants they dissected my um, pectoral muscles off my chest wall um, and then put the implant behind the muscle uh, and um, absolutely fantastic five and a half hour operation but incredible mm -hmm. and uh, so then recovery recovered very quickly actually from that amazingly quickly um, I was doing yoga for the lower half of my body within three days <laughs> so so that was good that was good um, <laughs> and, um, and then I, um, I I've carried on with I stopped taking HRT for a week when I knew the second one was estrogen receptor positive, I thought perhaps I shouldn't let it grow. Now this one was a, t a grade two and it was only 0.6 millimeters. So it was very small um, and it, sorry, six millimeters. Um, so the other one was 1.6 centimeters and this was six millimeters. So it's much smaller. Um, and it, but it was estrogen and, and progesterone receptor positive. Um, and it, and they said to me at the Marsden, we've, we've taken it away. Um, you don't need any screening. You don't need any follow up. Off you go. So, and I said to them, you know, I'm going, I am back on HRT. They said, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. You, you know, you, you're fine. So, um, so that's what's happened ever since. So I've been on my HRT. I didn't take it for a week once I knew it was Eastern receptor positive when we got the biopsy result and before surgery. But the day after surgery, I was sticking my estrogen gel back on my leg because I wanted to heal well and I wanted to have a good immune system. You know, I didn't want to get any infections and I wanted everything to work 
really well. So, so I went back on it and I'd made an amazingly quick recovery. Um, and, um, and then I did have, I decided to have my ovaries taken out and I'm really pleased I did because they said, well, because you've had breast cancer twice, you've probably got a 17% risk of ovarian cancer. And I said, right, well, I don't need those. I've got my HRT. I don't need the, the, the ovaries themselves, thank you. Um, and uh, so they actually then, um, they then did a very, it's a very minor procedure, very easy, as you know. Um, so that was done. And so I thought, right, that's sorted. Um, and I've just gone from strength to strength ever since, really. So, and then, and then in 2017, so that was 2014, in 2017, of course, fantastic. fantastic book came up, which was just lovely because then I could read for myself what a good decision I'd made. <laughs> <laughs> so you hadn't come across Avram blooming up until then? No. Not until his book, not yeah. until 2017. And then, then I was like, I, it blew my mind. It just, you know, I just thought, because the research I had done was like this. Yeah. And so I felt, but I, I'm not a statistician and I'm, you know, and so I just didn't, um, I didn't sort of trust my own thought. I thought that that's right. You know, I really felt it was right. But when I read his book, I thought I, it is right. Yeah, it been... is right. Yeah. Absolutely fine. And he's got a whole chapter on women post breast cancer having HRT. Now I, I do have a lot of patients um, who I give HRT to who have had breast cancer. And, um, you know, it's a very individual choice, obviously, and each each um, case is different and everyone's history is different and family history and so on. And their risk, um, you know, levels that they feel they can take is different. But I really believe the women I have seen and helped have come pleading for an improved quality of life because their quality of life is so rubbish that they really just can't bear they're what you know how they're living and the idea of living like that for another 40 years is like some sort of death sentence you know it's just it's awful it's like a prison sentence and actually it's you know they much prefer the idea of feeling better and well and reducing their risk of heart disease which is much more likely to kill them than breast cancer and reducing their risk of osteoporosis and uh, and of dementia and parkinson's and alzheimer's disease um, and arthritis and diabetes and hypothyroidism and all the rest you know um that uh, we will take our chances <laughs> you know? so so i mean i felt it was um it was sort of like um sod's law really that i was preventing all these diseases in women who had been fit and well up until their menopause and the poor women who had survived breast cancer were going to miss out on all of that and not get an opportunity to also be fit and well into their 70s 60s and 70s and 80s yeah. you know it's just it's just so unfair it's just so unfair to to survive something that is potentially life-threatening and then to have a life of misery <laughs> potentially potentially i know it's not everybody and some people don't feel like that and that's fine that's great but an awful lot of women do um and uh, and luckily i do think i do think that the um the oncologists some of the oncologists and some of the breast surgeons are starting to come round to being a bit more open-minded about it and are not just saying blank you know a blank no yeah. um a blanket no to everybody um and they are being a little bit more thoughtful about it and having a better discussion with women um you know and there and i had a lady the other day who was given offered letrozole but she then was told actually do you know what the, the oncologist said to her, the, the, the benefit is so minuscule, it's not worth your while being on it for all the risks and the side effects that you could have from it. So I was really quite in light, I was, I was in, you know, pleased to hear that really, that they're having that kind of conversation. Um, I do try and get my ladies to ask for the actual numbers when they're talking to their surgeons and oncologists, because I think you can make a better decision if you can see the numbers rather than percentages that don't mean anything. Um, and I think it's a very much an individual choice and we need to support women in that decision um, and help them. Now, just as an aside, um, since the summer, well, no, actually very recently, I did my, I had my genetics done. Now I'd had my genetics done when I first had the first breast cancer because I wanted to know if I had BRCA. And they said, I had a BRCA2 variant, but it was not significant. 
Now, my sister has since had breast cancer and my mother just died in February from ovarian cancer. And so I wonder whether we have got something going on there. And um, I also, when they took my ovaries out, in one of my ovaries, there was a little sort of precursor to cancer cells in one of the ovaries. So I would have got ovarian cancer if I had just left them. So I'm very pleased that I made that decision to get rid of them. Um, but very interestingly, I, I work with this amazing um, genetics company, really ethical genetics company called Life Code GX. And I've been having a lot of my patients' genetic pathways done with Life Code, especially my patients who've got um, muscle activation and histamine intolerance, to help us to drill down and really find out how to help them um, and to look at their methylation cycles and their thyroid and their estrogen cycles. Anyway, so. A lot of the, I've been learning a lot about estrogen metabolism because of, because of that. And I've been attending masterclasses and things on, online uh, all summer. And um, we have, w when we have estrogen in our bodies, we, our body obviously has to get rid of it and metabolize it away. Otherwise it would just accumulate forever in our body. So it's constantly metabolizing the estrogen away. And our estrogen can be metabolized down, th goes down three different pathways. And um, two of those pathways aren't great. You know, some of the byproducts that they make, the estrogen is good and protective, but then some of the byproducts of um, me its metabolism are a little bit toxic in the body. And, um, and there's one pathway that's great. It's like a sort of super highway, get it out efficiently, everything's nice and benign in that, and that's fine. Anyway, our genes affect our pathways. And when I had my genetics done, I've got crappy pathways. You know, my, my estrogen is pushed down my, the bad pathways. And then there's a bit of a bottleneck. So these um, toxins can accumulate um, in my body. And I have no doubt, I really feel quite certain in my mind that that's what caused the breast cancer. Now, the body is so clever and it knows that some of these pathways may not be super efficient. So it makes a substance, which is a really strong antioxidant called L-glutathione. So you're, most people, their bodies are making L-glutathione to counteract these toxic, potentially toxic chemicals that are constantly washing through our body. And, um, but do you, you need a gene to make the L-glutathione and I don't have that gene, it's completely absent. It's completely gone. Wow. So I can sort of look at that and think, well, I can see why I was vulnerable to it, really. Now, I have been on L-glutathione since probably 2017 because I read up about it then. But if I had gone on it when I was a young woman in my 30s or 20s, even better, I'm not, I'm not sure I would have had breast cancer. I think I would have supported my body. And also I could have taken some other vitamins and minerals, which would have helped push my estrogen down the super highway rather than the grotty <laughs> parts. And um, I think I could have influenced things. So it's really, it's really interesting to sort of start putting it all together. Do you have a daughter? I've got two daughters. So do you worry about them in terms of um, whether, I mean, have they been tested or are they going to? So we've done, no, we've done their, we've done their tests. Their, te their estrogen pathways aren't great, but they're not quite as bad as mine, mm. but um, they're both on L-glutathione. Right. And the other thing that we all have, and I would say, I would say this, I say this to all my patients, please have every day, all your husbands, the whole family, everyone has this, 40 mils of pomegranate juice every day and 40 mils of beetroot juice every day. Wow. Now, 40 mil, mils of pomegranate juice because pomegranate is really high in uh, antioxidants. It's, very, it's a very powerful, it's a super antioxidant, just like L-glutathione. And so it's, it's really um, good to be on that, just in case you've got genes like mine, you know, you don't know. Um, and so it's, it, it, even if you don't have genes like mine, it's good to get rid of the uh, oxidative stress in our bodies. So 40 mils every day. I was going to say, Sorry? have lots of research around this? Yes, there is. Yeah. There has been research. Yeah. And also there's research to show the other thing that pomegranate juice does. It's only a small study, but it's, it's, it's a good one. <laughs> um, that women, uh, people who take L, uh, the, um, take the um, uh, pomegranate juice, they um, can actually thin 
sorry, they can actually open up their arteries if they've got any narrowing of their arteries from cardiovascular disease. Wow. They can clean out the plaques. So why not be on it? It's delicious as well. So, you know, so we all take it in our family now. Um, and the, the, the beetroot juice, I would say, because of some of my genetic, the nutrigenomics work I've been learning about and studying, um, in our livers, we have this, um, this methylation cycle. Okay, it's five cycles that feed into each other. And one of them is called the methionine cycle. And methionine, this cycle converts something called homocysteine to methionine. And from the methionine, we make um, something called SAMe, which is really gives our energy to all our cells and all our processes. And it's so critical for RNA and DNA replication and so on. It's really important. It's like the sort of electricity of our body. And um, so we convert, we convert the homocysteine to methionine. Now there's, it goes through di two different pathways. And one of the pathways needs something called betaine. And betaine comes from beetroot juice. But again, the body realizes that this is such an important step, it will make its own betaine. However, some of us don't make great betaine <laughs> and therefore it's important for us to drink it or to eat it. Um, and if, you, if we don't have enough betaine, then homocysteine builds up and that causes heart disease. But also you don't have enough methionine, therefore you're going to be depriving your cells of energy for them to stay healthy and function properly. So it, you kill two birds with one stone by having the beetroot juice. So we just have both. And those who don't like beetroot juice just have to lump it basically. <laughs> and they have, they have the beetroot juice first. In, in fact, Marks and Spencer's make one that's got, uh, that's got um, black currant with it. It's quite nice. <laughs> so yeah. might... Well, Tina, I mean, you have given us so much food for thought here. I, I don't know where to start. I, I, we've got about five, ten minutes left. And I, I want to, first of all, say a few things and recap on a few things. Uh, first of all, to acknowledge what an unbelievable journey you've had and how brave you are. What you've been through is, and you're still smiling, is quite unbelievable. Um, I think for those who are watching, you know, it, I hope it gives them a lot of hope that actually... You know, you can, if you want to, take HRT, even though you've been through breast cancer. Um, and the, one of the things you spoke about, which um, we were talking about this week, actually, with Avram, and my dad mentioned right at the end, is this Montgomery judgment now, mm -hmm. where women, you know, the, you know from, I think, it, is it November the 9th, the, the GMC, you know, it, it's actually yeah. four now that women, you know, have the right to choose their treatment and have this informed discussion with their doctors, um, yeah. which, which is vital. And, and, you know, you're an educated woman, you're a, you're a doctor, um, and, and so you knew the questions to ask and, and mm. to see, which was... Yeah. But, but for, you know, the average, you know, woman on the street who, who just is grateful just to be looked after, I think what you've said about uh, your journey at the beginning with tamoxifen you know and doing that um, risk assessment my, you know my father always says that to me all the time tell me the absolute numbers not the you know not the relative risk um that that i i mean what i'd like to ask you is your take home message for for women must be to actually ask you know percent of what um, yeah yeah because i if I had heard what you heard, 50%, I would have been, oh, fine, I'll take it. And I yeah. never have stopped to say 50% of what. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, really, really important that people ask the right questions. And that has to be, well, what does that mean in numbers? You know, if you've got 100 women like me, what does that mean? over a 10 year period to give me some ideas so that I can make a judgment on it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I would really encourage everyone read estrogen matters, read around the subject, inform yourself. Cause I promise you, if you read this book, you'll know more about it than the doctors that you're seeing. <laughs> you, know? you, you will, you'll know more about the, 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 the studies and the pros and cons of the studies and the, you know, the flaws in the studies and so on. Yeah. Um, and it's really important to go on to that because it's ever so easy 
for somebody to pull the wool over your eyes, it, even inadvertently, not, not meaning, they're not meaning necessarily to be um, uh, unhelpful or uncaring, but if they believe a certain thing and it might be wrong because they were lectured to by somebody who hold, held old fashioned beliefs or, you know, hasn't, isn't up to date and they'll do that genuinely, they'll tell you and they can throw you off the scent very easily or no, it's just much safer for you not to be on it or whatever, but you need to have, be able to have a very informed decision, discussion. Uh, and if you're not getting anywhere with your GP, please come and see a specialist like myself mm. um, or, or, you know, get a referral to Chelsea Westminster. Uh, although at the moment they're not taking any new referrals since COVID, which is really sad and terrible. But, the, you know, see somebody who really is more comfortable discussing these things with you and has more information at their fingertips. Um, you know, it's good to involve the oncologists and the, and the breast surgeons in the discussion. Uh, but usually by the time people, people have come to me, they've perhaps been suffering for you know, eight years, six years, 10 years, and their breast cancer was 10 years ago. Yeah. And, and they're, they're still suffering and it's not necessary. And so then I, I write a letter. This is what we discussed. This is what we've decided. She's made an informed decision. So I don't ask them for permission to do it. I just do it and yeah. tell them this is what we're doing. And, and we, we've had so many women write to us who have traveled the country to find someone, anyone who will prescribe HRT to them. So, um, you know, it's been a fantastic month of menopause and breast cancer awareness conversations with pe people like yourself and with, we've had Diane Danzybrink, we've had obviously Av Blooming. And, and if anyone wants to uh, re-watch that um, chat with Avram, it, it really is very helpful. And, and obviously to read the book, um, mm. we, we've got a directory of menopause specialists on our website. Um, the BMS have a whole list of menopause mm. specialists. Um, obviously, if you can't get in to see anyone um, on the NHS, because sadly the waiting lists are very long then please yeah email me uh katie at latilounge.co and i will you know obviously signpost you to some wonderful doctors like tina and and all the we're, we're gonna um we're we're taping this uh tina we're gonna share it um on on all our social channels so people can re-watch it um you know i'm i'm really grateful and and also i think um Tina's going to help us um, write some wonderful things for our, our website um, because there's a lot to inform people about. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'm so pleased you look so well and you're doing oh. amazing things. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. You're brilliant at doing this. You're fantastic. <laughs> well, I'm happy technology works. And there's a couple of messages I'm going to really quickly read out. Yeah. Um, great discussion. So important getting this information out there to many, many women suffering with symptoms. Um, there was another lady, one more. Thank you. I'm in a very similar situation, um, suffering with hypothyroidism and osteopenia. Um, quite hard to read that but anyway i will i will print it off and um, send it to you but thank you everyone for watching and take care tina and thank you again for your bye 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 bye, bye. Yeah, bye.